Hello Guardians again, welcome back. This is part two of my reflection of my experience with Destiny 1 and going into Destiny 2. So this time I'm going to talk about Taken King and Rise of Iron and what happened with those. If you haven't watched the first part, I strongly encourage you to go back to get a little more context on me going into Taken King. So, speaking of what happened with the Taken King, so I led up to the day that it released last time. So, what ended up happening is I, I ended up taking an entire day off from work for the launch day of the Taken King. Much to the surprise of some of my friends, but I wanted to experience I wanted to go in early, experience it for myself. So... In the initial fire team, it was me, one of my other friends from at, from at the time, and then one of my other fire team mates from the UK, Hawk. And we played through the campaign. And needless to say, we got to the first... We got through the first story mission and we just went... Wow! Explosions, witty dialogue, introducing Oryx to us right off the get-go, the Taken, all of it. We were just like... We, we were... We were pretty impressed in that first mission. And then the following cutscenes with Cade sitting there and... Back talking Zavala and walking off and his telling Ares to get that rock off my map. We're like, oh my goodness, these characters will have character. What? The only way we'll stay ahead of the hive. Samples are crucial to this effort, Guardian. You understand that. So we continued playing through the campaign. We did Cade stash. We're like, we fought the Echo of Oryx and we're like, oh that's that's neat. Then we did the dread now, we're like, oh that's neat. So on and so forth, but what really got our attention was when we had to do the mission Last Rites. Where you go into Crota's end and steal Crota's soul, or what's left of it. And we went, Soul stealing, yeah. So we were Oh, we loved that mission. Then it led into fighting Oryx. Which, Oryx ended up dethroning Skolas as probably my, one of my favorite boss fights at the time from Destiny 1. I mean, you want to talk a true kind of final boss battle for the story? He's the one you look to in that fa regard. And then I did make the witty joke when he was beaten and he takenified himself right on the spot and I made the joke at the time, I was like, Oh, I'll see you in the raid! <laughs> so... Then it proceeded to going on to Act 2, which is where you went across the system clearing the, the different planets of the Taken. Eh, it was okay. I, I didn't mind. I didn't mind it so much. Because I knew it would lead up to the raid, but I'll tell you the, the quest line that really I liked. It was the Wolves of Mars. Where you went to Mars and the remnants of the House of Wolves had to be exterminated. That was a surprise. I was not expecting that. And of course, any content involving my man Varix is of high opinion to me, of course. And I got my first exotic from that quest. The Boolean Gemini, which I ended up using that for my first run of King's Fall. Which, don't not bully Gemini, it's decent. It's basically if Mida were more combat-oriented. Mida is still, is still better, mind you, but... It is an acceptable substitute, barring you don't have Mida. But we did that, we played through the different strikes. We played through Shield Brothers, Restorative Mind, Ek uh, Saber 2, and Alakul, which... We particularly enjoyed Ala Cool. But 
Plus, it was just awesome to say his name, kind of like how Ares did. I like cool. Plus, if we were in a dark room, and it was just different. There was a lot of stuff in Tekken King. It was very different from what we had come to experience at that point. But we enjoyed ourselves a lot. I mean, between the strikes. Oh, the new patrols, the Taken Knight. And then even setting up a new patrol. We set up the Dreadnought Patrol with the beacons. That was cool. We really liked that a lot. Just all these little improvements that... So subtle, yet so effective. And then even replacing Peter Dinklage with Nolan North as your ghost. And redoing the entire dialogue of the main campaign. I played through... The vanilla campaign again, just so I could hear all the dialogue redone. I mean, I was very much enjoying myself. And then the new, the new light system that they implemented where it was better than the year one version of light, I'll tell you that much. You could feel yourself progressively growing in power as time went on. It was fantastic. Infusion to help bring your stuff up. Consolidating all the marks into legendary marks. It was great. No cap on mark acquisition. Three of coins to get more exotics, which that ended up becoming a problem later down the line. But then it came time for King's Fall, which the first weekend... Me and Dorium did try with a fire team, but we didn't get very far. We beat the totals, but we didn't get to the war. We didn't beat War Priest. We didn't understand how to fight it. But it kind of pains me to say this, but King's Fall ended up being kind of a low point for Taken King for me. I mean, I appreciated that they had more mechanical complexity in in King's Fall. But what ended up happening, unfortunately, was that it came down to you had to have a fire team of six to do it. And one mistake from your fire team, from anyone in your fire team, could mean the encounter was lost, no matter which encounter you were doing. Oryx is the biggest offender, in my opinion. Granted, I enjoyed the War Priest fight. I kind of enjoyed Golgoroth, but I thought it was a bit of a pain. Totems was a little funny. Daughters is just a pain and Oryx was just, oh my god. Why? Why did you all make this so hard? And, and that you had to be so perfect. We didn't end up beating Oryx until the second weekend. Which, a good portion of what was left of our fire team broke off after that point. To which now it's just primarily me and my two my two buddies Dorium and Hawk both from the UK. And we've pretty much stuck with the with Destiny ever since. And we've had to LFG our way through the raids, which we don't like doing, but it's an it's a uh, necessary inconvenience. It was a necessary inconvenience for us to have to to be able to play all the content. So we kept playing and playing and playing, and we eventually got to the point with Taken King. We didn't get to max light on any characters, and we just, we tired out eventually because of, of having to do King's Fall. That's all the you know what that means. Then April Update came in April of 2016, and oh boy, man, were we happy. Challenge of the Elders. A, the, the Blighted Child Strike, which is really fun to do on higher difficulties. New gear, higher light, King's Fault was now easier. Oh my goodness, it was great. New story with Varix? Yes! Yes! We enjoyed the crap out of April Update. We must have played a good up into June with just that little bit of content they introduced. We did tire out eventually, because we ran out of stuff to do, and we got to 335. 
But we we did. Then we saw the announcement for Rise of Iron. And we were immediately hooked when they said that the that it would be about the Iron Banner and the Iron Lords. And by this point, I have been reading the Grimoire pretty extensively. I mean, I don't know it to the level that, say, someone like Mylan Games or My Name is Bife does, but I enjoyed the Grimoire up to that point. And reading it up to up to that point about all the things the Iron Banner had done. I was like, oh, this is exciting. And while I didn't enjoy Iron Banner as a PvP event, I do enjoy the Iron Lords as characters in the narrative. Which, that'll be a good diversion now to talk about that, which is what Destiny 1 did extremely well. And that is the narrative. See, because the thing is, you have the plot and you have the narrative. The plot is the actual story within the game itself. The narrative is how the story is told, or the lore in the background to build up to the plot. Destiny's narrative is excellent, at least in Destiny 1. The plot can sometimes be lacking. Taken King wasn't lacking, it was pretty good. But then they start introducing all the different things, like we're going to get a new raid, we're going to get the Plague Lance Patrol, which is an addition to Cosmodrome, we're going to get a new social space, and all this... Just all this stuff, it was really exciting for us. And being about the Iron Banner, we, we forked over the money almost instantly. So, launch day comes. Oh, which, before I go to that, they, when they showed a little bit of Wrath of the Machine, I loved what I saw. It was like, to me, it was just like Mad Max brought the game form, and it was fantastic to me. I really wanted to fight the Siege Engine so badly. At the time, we kept calling it the Zamboni. Um. So, Rise of Iron comes, day one. First mission, you go to get the Iron Temple back from the Fallen. Oh, we, l oh, that was great. Liberating your social space for use? Great. Mission 2 was a little... Mission 2 was a little, uh, unfulfilling. But then Mission 3, where we had to go take down those cannons, that was better. It introduced us to the Plague Lands, and we quite enjoyed that. We got to see the entrance to the raid. We, we were like, okay, we're getting there. But something was wrong, because we went to... We got the cutscene after that mission where... Saladin explained what happened to the Iron Lords when they went into the Siva complex. And we couldn't help but notice that the plot was a little... inconsistent? Holy, at best? But then we've, we were told, oh, you gotta go to Mars to Clovis Bray and find out where the Splicers got all, the, all their Siva samples from. So we're like, hell yeah. So we go there. That was short. It didn't last. But then we did the last mission. Where you go into the the complex. The Iron Tomb. And... That was the first time like, where we fought a story boss in Destiny that we actually had some trouble with it. Where you had to use the axe to take down their shield and then attack them normally. We actually struggled. I mean, we're like, okay, props to them for creating a final boss in the story that we actually had a struggle against. But we still didn't quite 100% understand what we were doing. But we succeeded. Then we did all the strikes. You know, we did, which we particularly liked Sepik's Perfected. For obvious reasons. We, oh, and then we got introduced to the Skeleton Keys, where you got guaranteed strike-specific loot. Which, that was also another praise of ours to Destiny 1, was the strike-specific loot that gave you a reason to grind a strike to get those things. They may not have been better gear, but it was just cool to have, because it was very unique. I always wore the, the Helm of Allah Cool. On my titan just because to me it was like I took the skull of my defeated foe and was wearing it to show to everybody. 
It didn't match the rest of my armor 95% of the time, but I didn't care. <laughs> but, needless to say, we did the strikes, we did all the other stuff. Worked on the scout keys, worked on our light. Got to the requirement for the raid for Wrath of the Machine. I watched it the first weekend, I didn't participate, but I came into the next time knowing what I was doing. But when I play Wrath of the Machine, I fell in love with it. Because to me, it took everything that was that was good about Vault, Crota, and even the bits that were good about King's Fall, and combined them together into one raid. The entrance where you fight Vosik, where you didn't need max fire team members to win. The jumping puzzles, which weren't overly difficult, but complex enough to keep you invested. Fighting Vosik again with the monitors. And then my personal favorite part, the siege engine. It is so worth it fighting that boss just to watch it fall into the ocean. And the gear was excellent. Bonus damage to splicers, increased heavy ammo, more armor when holding the relics of the raid. It was great. It actually harkened back to the gear of Crota's End where they had similar effects. And then Axis, which I quite enjoyed slamming stuff into his back to stun him. Not to mention, he actually, I was like, a final raid boss that actually moves around and tries to kill you proactively? What? What is this sorcery? Needless to say, Rise of Iron left me on a really... It left a really positive impression. Despite not having as much content as I would have liked, it was a good, and the Wrath of the Machine left a really good impression on me. I did the hard mode, I did the challenges, just like King's Fall, I did those challenges too, but I found myself enjoying the Wrath of the Machine stuff a bit more, except with the exception of King's Fall's Oryx challenge, where, which just killing, just killing him with 16 bombs, that felt good. But, it came down to another issue. I ran out of stuff to do by the end of by December. So, forced break through the, for the game, but then Age of Triumph comes along, revitalizes all the raids and all that. Oh, I almost forgot about the dawning. I like the dawning. Actually, the dawning was an okay event. It was much better than Festival of the Cost <laughs> from 2016. But but yeah, real quick remark on that. I liked the I liked what they did there, and I especially liked how they handled Tanix and Omnigul's redos on their strikes. Not to mention getting the Abaddon and Nova Mortis and the Icebreaker, and giving Nightfalls more rewards. That was fantastic. But skipping the Age of Triumph, when I saw the the docket for Age of Triumph with all the changes. I was like, oh my god, this is exactly what I was wanting. All the raids brought up to, to 390. Improved gear and perks. Vault and Crota getting a little bit of a, of a retool to replace some of the more out-of-dated mechanics. Yes, please. Challenges? Oh my good. And nothing pleased me more than when Crota was up first for Age of Triumph. And all the changes, like, I laughed hysterically when I found out you couldn't jump the abyss anymore and they just put, like, this crude barricade to stop you. It was funny. And I tried to prank some of my fire teammates into doing it. But they'd already they already knew about it beforehand, so I couldn't really trick them. 
So you had to do the abyss properly, which was fun, actually. And then there was the the bridge, which you had to change how you did it, but taking on all those knights with those swords, that was great. Not to mention very hysterical when you have about 25 knights trying to kill you. But the highlight, though for me, for the revised Crota Zim was the Death Singer Challenge. Where you smack that bitch ear you in the face with a sword. For all the pain and suffering she's inflicted upon you from year one. Then Vault comes. Then Vault came. The Templar challenge. Oh, that was great. I just loved watching the Templar be helpless as he just couldn't teleport. That was awesome. Shorter Templars well, which was gravely needed. Just good changes. But then King's Fall and Wrath of the Machine really didn't get any changes. So it was just like, eh, who cares? I played Age of Triumph for probably a good month, month and a half to two months, getting all the new revised raid gear, and I was quite happy for a time. Then, it happened. Destiny 2 gets revealed. And they promised all these different things. All new destinations. New plot that's really good with the Cabal. A new raid. Guided games. All this stuff. All these enhancements. I was excited. I was excited. Great, I didn't pre-order immediately, but I ended up... I ended up watching some of the stuff, and eventually I did pre-order the game. Just because I was excited to see what the future held for it. And all the positive things I was seeing about it. And then I do remember the ever-so-popular hype of... This could be a 50-hour campaign. Which I thought was, I was skeptical, considering what had been released before, but I had every right to be. But I didn't think much of it. Which, I thought of all the possibilities they could do with Destiny 2, Vanilla. And the time came, after some shenanigans with my pre-order or I didn't get to play Destiny 2 the first day I finally got to play the sequel that I had been waiting for but unfortunately things started to sink from there which is just where we're going to get to the unfortunate part of the story which will go will happen next time. And I imagine the part about Destiny 2 is the part you will want to hear the most from me. As you probably want to hear my take on it after playing Destiny 1 almost through its entire duration and then looking at everything that's changed. And what I think. So, with that, I'll end this part here, and I'll talk about Destiny 2 the next time. Tune in, and hear what I have to say.